In this lecture, we'll be covering chapter 17, which deals with fatty acid metabolism. And in particular, uh, we'll focus on the, the catabolic process, the process of fatty acids being oxidized and, and broken down. And we won't be discussing um, the synthesis and building up of fatty acids uh, in, in this cl class. The title slide gives a, a pretty decent overview of what we'll be discussing. Uh, first, in section one, we'll talk about how fatty acids are, are mobilized and moved around uh, the body. Um, and then we'll discuss a little bit about how they are uh, activated by adding uh, coenzyme A to them, uh, and then a, a enzyme called CPT1 changes that fatty acyl CoA into an acyl carnitine. It attaches carnitine, and when it does that, it's doing that so it can be transported into the mitochondria, into the matrix of the mitochondria specifically. Okay? And then you have uh, an enzyme very similar to that on the inside, uh, operating in the reverse direction that removes. Uh, the carnitine and changes it back to the fatty acyl CoA, which then can go undergo what's called beta oxidation. Um, we'll be giving lots of specifics about that in this lecture. Uh, beta oxidation, what that gets out ultimately is uh, acetyl CoA, which goes in the citric acid cycle, like we've we've talked about before. Uh, you also get directly out of that some reduced cofactors, um, FADH2. Um, all of that leads to funneling into the electron transport chain and the production of, of a lot, a great deal of ATP. And we'll see, um, this is, you know, uh, it generates the most ATP uh, of, of way more than, than carbohydrates do. So the oxidation of these long chain fatty acids um, to acetyl CoA is a very important energy producing pathway in in most uh, higher organisms, um, and it produces a great deal of energy, um, the vast majority of energy in certain tissues such as the heart and the liver uh, in mammals. Okay. Electrons removed from these fatty acids during this oxidation uh, go through the respiratory chain and drive ATP synthesis. So when fats are ingested into the body, um, the gallbladder makes bile salts that emulsify them, solubilize them, and they can be absorbed through the small intestine. Okay. Um, you can uh, then they are combined with uh, apolipoproteins um, that, you know, kind of help to solubilize them and, and mobilize them along with uh, cholesterol. And these particles um, are shown here, okay? That name is very uh, hard for me to pronounce. Uh, Clylomicron, um, don't really, in my experience, I've never really heard people refer to this, but um, I don't really work in directly in this part of the uh, the field, the biochemistry. Um, they are then can be shuttled through the the bloodstream, and when they come to you know tissues that need them, um, they can be uh, mobilized into those cells and used as energy, or they can be um, turned into um, uh, uh, triacylglycerols at first for storage, depending on you know what type of cell you're in. So in in the the figure here in the book, myocyte, which would be you know a muscle cell, they'd be um, a, a used as as fuel. In a adipocyte uh, fat cell, um, they'd be used for storage. Right, so a little bit on how this is, is done uh, is shown in this figure. Okay. Uh, it, the process is controlled uh, hormonally. Um, not, not surprising uh, when we talked about chapter 12. Last semester, we, we talked about all the, um, you know, how 
how these small signaling molecules can really control what cells are doing at any particular time. Um, one of those things that can be controlled is the mobilization of, of fat. Okay. And so here we have our receptor uh, and glucagon is our, our um, uh, signaling molecule, right? That activates our G protein, our, our GS alpha, turns on adenyl cyclase. We get cyclic AMP, which then turns on uh, protein kinase A. Protein kinase A then can trigger something that allows uh, this lipid droplet inside the fat cell to open and let out uh, individual fatty acids, right? And so they're stored usually as triacylglycerols. So it's a glycerol with three fatty acid chains on it. We have a, an enzyme that, you know, removes them, um, cuts them apart uh, individually until we get three separate fatty acids and a glycerol, okay? These fatty acids can then leave that, that fat cell and be transported, transported through the bloodstream into a, uh, something like a muscle cell uh, where there's a transporter they go through and then they undergo beta oxidation. And, and how they move through the bloodstream, the uh, fatty acids themselves are, are pretty poorly soluble, so they, they wouldn't move very uh, efficiently through the, the bloodstream in a mostly aqueous environment. So things like um, uh, this protein human serum albumin, um, which you might have heard of, um, this is a, a way that they can be carried. They bind uh, non-covalently to this protein and are shuttled around the bloodstream. And this protein um, makes up you know, about half of the total serum protein. So about half of the protein uh, that's in your bloodstream is this uh, uh, human serum albumin. Uh, just if you're curious, uh, right, triacylglycerols, we've talked about how the fatty acids get, get cut off and moved around. That, le that leaves a glycerol. Um, glycerols also can be used uh, and for energy, and how they are used uh, is shown here. You don't need to know any of these details. Um, but basically, the glycerol is converted into uh, glycerol aldehyde phos uh, 3 phosphate, which can then enter into glycolysis. If you, if you remember back to glycolysis, um, we, we saw that um, glycerol aldehyde 3 phosphate. Okay. Right, fatty acids are, are activated and transported into the mitochondria for, for oxidation, for their ultimate breakdown and, and usage for energy. Right. Smaller fatty acids that are less than about 12 carbons can diffuse freely across mitochondrial membranes. Bigger fatty acids um, need something called the carnitine shuttle. Right? And in these, this carnitine shuttle is transporting longer chain fatty acids, those that have 14 or more carbons through the mitochondrial membrane. Right? And it requires activation uh, to a fatty acyl-CoA and attachment to then attachment to carnitine. So how is the fatty, acid, fatty acyl-CoA produced? Well, this process takes ATP, right? It, it, you use energy to do this. So the fatty acid uh, is shown here in red and the R just stands for, you know, uh, let's say it's 16 carbons or something. It's, it's something greater than 12, right? Uh, a fatty acyl-CoA synthetase uh, takes ATP and that fatty acid and it attaches uh, the, an AMP to the end of that fatty acid. Okay. And you're left with uh, the pyrophosphate. Okay. Then in the second step, the fatty acyl-CoA synthetase, same enzyme, You've, you've sort of energized this fatty uh, acid with an AMP on it okay, and made a, a, a stronger leaving group. And then the coenzyme A shown here can, can attack that, that carbonyl carbon uh, and the AMP is our leaving group. And we have our fatty acyl uh, CoA at the end. Okay. So you first have to add that 
that AMP to make something that's uh, a better leaving group, higher in energy. So you're using energy to do that. You're using up an ATP, uh, and then you can attach the coenzyme A to it. Okay. And we'll see the coenzyme A is critical to being able to break down this fatty acid. Uh, this pyrophosphate, it turns out, um, can also be cleaved by, by this enzyme okay, to give you some more energy for this process uh, in, in another step. But really, we're just focused on what this enzyme is doing. Right? You add an AMP to it, you're using ATP, uh, and then coenzyme A can then be added. In the next step, we're going to add a, a carnitine to this. So what carnitine looks like, the structure is shown down here. You have this uh, quaternary amine group here, so it has a positive charge, and then a carboxylic acid on this side. So that's, you know, the, the basic structure of carnitine. Um, not that you'll really need to know that, right? Because it's a, it's a sort of a temporary attachment. Uh, it's transient. So here we have our uh, fatty acyl-CoA that we've produced by our uh, acyl-CoA synthetase. This is in the cytosol, by the way. Okay. This, then, uh, there's an enzyme called carnitine acyl transferase 1, which can take our uh, acyl-CoA and carnitine, and basically what it's doing is it's swapping our CoA group for carnitine to make a, a, our acyl-carnitine. Right, which then can be transported um, straight from, from the cytosol uh, through the inner membrane space and into the matrix. Okay. Once it's in the matrix, this uh, acyl carnitine is then converted back into our, an acyl CoA. So you'll notice here you have pools of coenzyme A uh, out in the cytosol and one in the matrix of the mitochondria. Right? and you have carnitine going back and forth. Okay, so once it does that, once it takes it off, it, it sends it out. And this is an antiport, so every time an acyl carnitine goes in, a single carnitine, un, um, unattached carnitine is going back out. Okay. Right, so as I mentioned, you have two pools of coenzyme A. Uh, the coenzyme A in the matrix is largely used for this oxidative degradation uh, of either pyruvate or fatty acids and some amino acids, which we'll discuss in, in chapter 18. Okay. Coenzyme A in the cytosol is used primarily for biosynthesis of fatty acids, okay? and that's something we don't really touch on in this class. All right. You'll also have two pools of fatty acyl-CoAs. Um, those in the mitochondrial matrix, again, are being used for oxidation and energy production, ATP production. Okay. Uh, those in the cytosol can be used for um, membrane lipid synthesis, stuff like that. Okay. Right, this, this shuttle point, uh, getting the, your acyl-CoAs into the mitochondria, is a major control point for fatty acid oxidation. Right. And this is actually the rate limiting step for, for the oxidation of fatty acids. Right. And you can um, imagine, right, you don't want to be, if you're synthesizing a bunch of fatty acids uh, in producing them, you don't want to also be bringing them into the mitochondria and breaking them down right away. Okay, so that, that's um, what's known as a feudal cycle. When you're producing something and then breaking it down at the same time, you, all, you're, all you're doing there is just wasting energy. So uh, this protein, the, the carnitine acyl transferase 1, is the one that's, uh, this, that transports these into the mitochondria. It's the one that's regulated, and it's inhibited by this, mole, uh, this molecule uh, melanol-CoA, and that's actually the first intermediate in the in fatty acid synthesis so we won't really see that directly because we don't talk about fatty acid synthesis but this is the the first intermediate in the synthesis of fatty acids so it makes sense that this is if there's a lot of this around you have a lot of fatty acid synthesis going on 
and you don't need to be bringing it into the mitochondria, um, fatty acids into the mitochondria to, to be breaking them down. So moving on to section two, and this is where we'll spend most of our time talking about beta oxidation. All right, what is beta oxidation? That's kind of a funny term. Well, it's, it's just the, the breakdown of a fatty acid. Okay, so you can kind of think of it as it, it's like glycolysis um, for fatty acids. Um, why it's called beta oxidation is it's because the oxidation is occurring at C3 in the fatty acid, which would be the beta position. Okay, so that's all that beta oxidation means. Okay, you're oxidizing that beta position. Okay. There are three stages to the oxidation of fatty acids. So just as an overview, okay, uh, stage one would be uh, beta oxidation. And here we have a, a our fatty acid shown here. Each step of beta oxidation, we're going to be losing two carbons out of that, that chain. Okay? And, and that, that's going through beta oxidation. Doing that, we're going to be producing electrons, which go into our reducing our cofactors, NADH and FADH2. Right? In stage two, um, what we're producing ultimately by removing two carbons uh, in the beta oxidation steps are we're producing acetyl CoA's. So those acetyl CoA's are going to go into the citric acid cycle and, and be turned into CO2. Uh, and that generates uh, more electrons, which are used to reduce our cofactors, NADH and FADH2. And then finally, stage three is all of these reduced cofactors bringing their electrons into the main respiratory chain and that's what ultimately produces the ATPs. And, and we'll talk about each uh, each of these steps uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay. This figure, uh, it's not from the book, but I think it's a, a good figure for the uh, showing beta oxidation in detail and it's a little bit different in, than our book because it's shown as a, uh, a a circle a cycle and oftentimes you, you don't really see that you see it more in a linear form with a, a long arrow coming all the way back up to the top but I think I included this because it, it might help you just another way for you to see it it starts here um, it's kind of hard to pick out where a, a circle starts, but we're going to start here uh, with our fatty acyl CoA. Okay, so it's a fatty acid with coenzyme A attached to it to to activate it to tag it for oxidation. Okay, so this is our our um, carbonyl carbon. Okay, so that's carbon one. The alpha carbon would be the next carbon or carbon two, and beta carbon would be carbon three. So these, the alpha and beta carbons are really the ones to watch here. Okay. There are four steps to this beta oxidation. Okay. The first step is uh, catalyzed by an enzyme known as an acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. And what that is doing is it's using an FAD, a flavin cofactor, uh, oxidized cofactor, and it's reducing that cofactor and it's reducing it by taking uh, electrons and, and hydrogen uh, from your fatty acyl CoA to make a transenoyl CoA, right? So we're adding a double bond there between the alpha carbon and beta carbon. That's the first step. And by doing that, we're reducing FAD to FADH2. Okay. Second step is enol CoA uh, hydratase and we're then hydrating that double bond. Okay? It uses water. Okay? And when we do that, we get a, an OH group. So we're adding, instead of a double bond now, we have an alcohol. So if you look at this, right, uh, these are all single bonds. By adding a double bond there, we're oxidizing it. By adding an OH group, we're oxidizing this further. Okay? The next step, uh, we're gonna change that alcohol, that OH group, into a, a ketone. Okay, so that's another oxidative step. 
and that's ca that's carried out by this um, hydroxy acyl CoA dehydrogenase. And that uses, unlike the acyl CoA dehydrogenase, this one uses NAD and we're producing NADH. So we're reducing NAD to NADH and oxidizing our alcohol to a ketone. Yeah. Right, and specifically this whole molecule is called a, a beta keto acyl CoA. Probably not important that you know that. Right, just remember that that's a ketone and it's on the beta carbon, right? And the last step in this cycle, thiolase, this is the enzyme, will cut this into two parts and it cuts it between alpha and beta. What's left over here is uh, two carbon, right? With a, a carbonyl group attached to a CoA, right? That's just acetyl-CoA. And we remember acetyl-CoA from uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase and funneling that into the citric acid cycle. Okay, so that's, that's then earmarked for the citric acid cycle. Okay, and what we're left with on the other side is our beta carbon now is uh, the, the new start, the new carbon one of our fatty acid. Okay, and it has a, a, a CoA attached to it as well. Okay, so we have our fatty acid chain, but now it's just shortened by two carbons, and then it can go back into this cycle. And it chops off two carbons every time you go through this. Uh, another way to look at this uh, shown here, okay, um, this is more of a typical way of doing it. You have this linear, um, but you know, however, it's good for you to look at this and remember it, um, just including more of these. Okay. Here's, an, here's another way, and it's sort of color-coded. Uh, I, I don't really like this that well, just because, you know, your cofactors are color-coded, but you don't really color-code. I think the, the more important thing to color-code is probably the, the fatty acid, especially alpha and beta, just to highlight what's going on, but um, some of you might, might be able to see it better with this one. Okay. So if we look at these steps uh, in a little bit more detail, uh, the four steps here of beta oxidation. At the first step, you're taking a fatty acyl-CoA and turning it into uh, this trans-enoil-CoA. Okay. You're adding that double bond between alpha and beta carbons. Okay, and again, that's done by your acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. There are different isozymes for this, this enzyme, okay? and it, they, they all act on um, different chain lengths of fatty acids. Uh, you have things like VLCAD, which stands for very long chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, MCAD, which would be medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, and SCAD, which is small chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. Okay, and the, the, what they work on, the chain lengths are shown here, and you'll notice there, there is some overlap there. Okay. Um, all of them are important because you have varying chain lengths of fatty acids in your body that need to be broken down for energy. Um, so in, in this example from the book uh, figure, it's starting with uh, pamidyl-CoA, which is uh, 16 carbons long. So that's what we're starting with, a 16 carbon chain length. Okay. This first step of, of adding that double bond in there between alpha and beta carbons generates two electrons in the form of an FADH2. Those are funneled to the respiratory chain um, by a couple proteins called ETF and ETFQO, um, and, and we'll show those in detail uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, First, I wanted to just bring up, there are genetic defects. Uh, if you have problems in this enzyme, um, uh, these acyl-CoA dehydrogenases, one of those is um, MCAD, the medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. And this is a, it's a rare disease, but it's, it's fairly common. Um, I work in a, in a lab that, at, at Anschutz that deals with, um, metabolic disorders and this is one of the i would say 
more prevalent ones um, that the clinical lab sees. Um, at least that's, I, I hear about this quite a bit. Um, it's a autosomal recessive uh, disorder, so you need two mutant MCAD genes. Uh, and if that happens, you get um, what's known as the MCAD disease. And, and the symptoms are shown here, and it's a, a very severe disorder. We'll show uh, in this lecture, we'll be showing other disorders as well. When, when problems happen in these metabolic pathways, uh, it, it can be pretty, um, pretty severe. Uh, you know, not, not necessarily as severe as something like glycolysis would be, because that's a central metabolic pathway, but these pathways are, are also very important. Right, and so those electrons that are, are generated by our acyl-CoA dehydrogenase are funneled through to the main respiratory chain by a couple of proteins. One ETF uh, is a soluble or thought of as soluble protein, and it stands for electron transferring flavoprotein. Okay, so it takes it's it's using a flavin cofactor to take electrons from the FADH2 that's on the acyl CoA dehydrogenase, and then it transfers them to ETFQO, which has a very long name, uh, electron transferring flavoprotein ubiquinone oxidoreductase. Okay, uh, or you can just use this abbreviation ETFQO. Right, it uses. Uh, iron sulfur cluster, uh, and then uh, a flavin to ultimately reduce uh, ubiquinone. Okay? And remember, ubiquinone or coenzyme Q then transfers it to complex three. So that's how these electrons uh, get, get um, shuttled into the main respiratory chain. And I did some research on both ETF and ETFQO um, in grad school. So that's kind of how I know uh, a little bit more about these. Um, these, it kind of seems like a sort of secondary pathway, right? Because um, you have glycolysis funneling a bunch of electrons into this uh, main respiratory chain. And then you have uh, this fatty acid beta oxidation. And this is just one little step on, on beta oxidation. But if you have mutations in, in ETF or ETFQO that doesn't, they don't allow the electrons to go into the main respiratory chain, that leads to a, a very severe disorder called glutaric acidemia type 2 or GA2. And it can be fatal within just a few days after birth if the mutation is severe enough. So that just shows you how important all of these branches in metabolism are. Right, our step two in beta oxidation is our hydration of that double bond. Right, and that, again, it's, it's carried out by enoyl-CoA hydratase. We're using H2O in this process, and we're adding an OH group to our beta carbon. Right, step three is our dehydration. Uh, or you can think of it as converting our alcohol group to a, a ketone, right, and that's carried out by our uh, beta hydroxyacyl CoA dehydrogenase. Okay, and this is our second electron generating step. So, step one and step three are generating electrons. Right, and this one, we're using our mobile, uh, the beta hydroxyacyl CoA dehydrogenase uses a mobile electron carrier, NAD, and we can, we're reducing it to NADH which then directly transfers it into the respiratory chain via complex one. Right, so step one, those electrons go into the respiratory chain with some help for, for carrier proteins, uh, and they go into complex three. The step three, our electrons are going into the respiratory chain via complex one. Right, and our last step, um, I shouldn't say our last step. The, the next step here, uh, we have our acyl-CoA uh, acetyltransferase or thiolase, which would be our, our fourth step okay, in this process. Uh, 
All right, and that's going to all right, take our, basically cleave that bond and, and produce an acetyl-CoA, right? So that bond between the alpha carbon and the beta carbon, right? And then it, it also uses a, another coenzyme A, which it attaches to our uh, previous beta carbon, okay? To produce a acyl-CoA that is two carbons shorter. So we started in this diagram with car, uh, 16 carbons, and now we have 14 carbons after one pass through it. All right, so the chemical logic of this beta oxidation sequence, the first three reactions, you're converting a single bond between the two methylene groups, the alpha and beta carbons, to a less stable bond. Right, and you do that so that that bond can actually be broken eventually. Yeah. The ketone function on the beta carbon makes it a good target for a nucleophilic attack, right? So that's making it a good target to be used as our new um, carbon one. Okay? And the terminal um, acetyl-CoA is a good leaving group, uh, and that's what facilitates that breakage of that alpha-beta bond. Right, and this reaction sequence is actually pretty similar to some that we've seen uh, in the citric acid cycle. So in the citric acid cycle, um, that first step there in that citric acid cycle, we're also reducing FAD to FADH2, and we're adding that, that enol group there. Okay, it's same thing in beta oxidation. Then we hydrate it, and then we use our NADH cofactor um, to turn the alcohol into a ketone. Right. And, and this is also used in oxidation of, of uh, isoleucine, isoleucine, leucine, and valine, some of the, the, the branch chain amino acids. It, it we'll see that in the next chapter. So these four steps of beta oxidation are repeated again and again until we're left with two molecules of, of acetyl-CoA, assuming that we have an even number of carbons in our chain length. Okay, so if we started with 16, all right, the next step we'd have to start with 14, then 12, then 10, etc., cetera, uh, until we reach a carbon-4 uh, chain length, goes through again, and we'd get two molecules of acetyl-CoA from that. All right, and those acetyl-CoAs then can be uh, funneled into the citric acid cycle. So the next few slides we're going to have um, probably be good for your notes. I don't know how well it'll translate just me reading them in, in this lecture, but they're just kind of some bookkeeping slides. And I think the, the most important one will be the last one. There'll be a table as well that, that shows you exactly how many ATPs are generated. But let's just go through this uh, step by step. So each pass uh, of the um, beta oxidation cycle, we're, we're making one molecule of acetyl-CoA, removing that from our fatty acid. We're getting two pairs of electrons, uh, reducing cofactors, and we're producing four protons, right? Probably not as important to remember the protons, but definitely the, the molecules of acetyl-CoA and being able to, to remember how many pairs of electrons are being generated. Right, the overall reaction of just one cycle through this, if we started with our uh, palmitoyl-CoA, which is 16 carbons, right, we need a, a coenzyme A as a cofactor, an FAD, and an NAD. Right, so that, those are all the things that are, are really needed, and an H2O for that hydration reaction. Right, what we get out is 14 carbon fatty acid, or fatty acyl-CoA specifically, an acetyl-CoA, FADH2, NADH, and, a, and an H+. So we have two reduced cofactors, uh, an acetyl-CoA, which goes into the citric acid cycle, and our fatty acid, that's one, uh, two carbons, excuse me, less in chain length. Right, if we go all the way through uh, the whole way through a beta oxidation to completely break down our starting 16 carbon fatty acid, what would we need? 
uh, and what would be produced? Well, we would produce eight acetyl-CoA's. Remember, each acetyl-CoA has two carbons. We start with 16 carbons, so we're going to produce eight of those for full breakdown. To do that, we would need seven cycles through. So seven coenzyme A's, seven FAD's, and seven NAD pluses would be converted into seven FADH2's and seven NADH's. And then we would need you know, seven CoA's to make our eight acetyl CoA's. All right, let's think back to our, um, well, uh, our, our main um, respiratory chain discussion, which we've, we've talked about already in chapter 19. Right. This, this is chapter 17, so if you just read the book straight through, you wouldn't really have covered this yet, right? but we have. Um, remember, each FADH2 donates a pair of electrons uh, to ETF, and then it goes in the main respiratory chain. That can generate uh, 1.5 molecules of ATP per FADH2. Uh, each NADH is... is a little bit stronger in that production because it's going through complex one, not complex three. So we can generate 2.5 molecules of ATP for every NADH. So if every cycle of beta oxidation, you're producing one FADH2 and, and one NADH, that means you're producing 1.5 plus 2.5 or four total ATPs for every, for every cycle through beta oxidation. Right, so th that's the, those are the electrons that are, are directly from beta oxidation and each cycle is directly producing four ATPs. All right, and if we, if we look at our overall reaction again, those seven FADHs and, and seven NADHs um, are going to produce a total of 28 ATPs, right? If we go, other words, if we go seven cycles of beta oxidation, we're going to be producing seven times four or 28 ATPs. That's, those are directly from this beta oxidation. Well, the acetyl-CoA, the eight acetyl-CoAs that we're producing uh, can also be further oxidized through the citric acid cycle. And the stoichiometry of that looks like this. Right, eight acetyl CoA's would produce 80 ATPs. All right, and that's um, that's the citric citric acid cycle and uh, the main respiratory chain. So that's we're not really going through the individual steps there, but that's the the overview. So our overall reaction of completely breaking down our 16 carbon fatty acid is shown here. And the thing to really um, remember or to get, get, take away from this is you're producing 108 ATPs. All right, that's a, a huge number for one 16 carbon uh, chain length fatty acid. And the table in the book, 17.1, uh, it's showing the yield. Uh, this is just another way of, of showing this information, maybe a little bit easier to, to digest. Okay. Uh, and it shows you the enzymes responsible for producing these, these reduced cofactors and how many uh, ATPs they generate. So this is, again, going using our uh, palmitoyl-CoA, which is 16 carbons long. Right. So we're doing seven cycles uh, of beta oxidation. Right? And through the citric acid cycle, if we put eight molecules of acetyl-CoA through that, um, the cofactors that would be generated in each of these steps. Well, that's all well and good when you have uh, very easy, um, even number fatty acid chain lengths.
uh, what happens uh, it, if you have you know unsaturated um, double bonds in your chain, or if you have uh, an odd number of fat, uh, carbons in your fatty acid? It gets a little bit more complicated. Right. So I don't want to focus too much on the details uh, in these cases, but I'd like you to know that there there are ways to that that your cells work around this ultimately to feed it into um, normal beta oxidation right. so with respect to uh, unsaturated fatty acids those that have double bonds what happens is you'll go through that fatty acid will go through beta oxidation the same as any other fatty acid would until it encounters um, the, a double bond at at position um, starting at the, the beta position. So that's shown here. Right. So we have our, our carbon one, uh, alpha carbon and beta carbon. Once that, you, in, in this case, we've gone through three cycles of beta oxidation. Once it gets to here, where we have this double bond, okay, that double bond is a, a cis double bond. And the, the enoyl, enoyl CoA hydratase the molecule, the enzyme that would use this um, in our beta oxidation can't use uh, the cis double bond. It needs to be in a trans conformation. So this is the, the example of where trans double bonds in fatty acids are important. It's in beta oxidation. All right, so we have an enzyme called uh, delta-3, delta-2, enoyl-CoA isomerase. Okay, so what, what it's doing is it's isomerizing this from a cis to a trans double bond. Right, so we're taking our cis double bond that's in the beta position and moving it into a, a, a trans double bond. Right? And, and we're, we're moving it as well between, this would be beta and gamma carbons, it's moving that double bond between the beta and alpha carbons. Okay, so two things, converting it from cis to a trans, and moving it from uh, beta gamma to uh, beta and alpha, right? And so this should look very um, familiar. Uh, this moiety here is, is one that you could feed directly back into beta oxidation where our enoyl CoA hydratase can work on and, and put an OH group there on the, the beta carbon, right? So we just need, the, if we have a uh, monosaturated mono unsaturated uh, fat, we just need this one extra enzyme, one extra step. If we have a, a multiple double bonds, so poly unsaturated, right, we need two steps. Right? Again, we, we do our beta oxidation until we get a double bond uh, in that beta position. Okay, then we use that enol CoA isomerase to move that and convert that cis to a trans double bond between alpha and beta, right? Then that can be cleaved away as um, a um, uh, coenzyme A. But before that that happens, um, you get the removal of this second double bond. Okay, and that's by a, a protein called dienoyl-CoA reductase, right? So that's just uh, oxidizing that double bond, okay? So uh, to remove it, and then you get um, your, your double bond in this position, uh, and then you, again, need to use your enoyl-CoA isomerase to move it back to the correct position, okay? So there's uh, a couple different steps here. And that for this class, you won't need to know these these steps, but just know that there there is a mechanism to to use unsaturated fatty acids in beta oxidation. All right. So the last workaround you would need to do in beta oxidation would be for odd chain fatty acids. We typically tend to talk about even chain fatty acids because. When they're synthesized, they tend to be synthesized in, in pairs of two. And when they're broken down, right, it's easy for us to see, oh, these two carbons go off in, as acetyl-CoA, and that goes to the citric acid cycle. Very easy to, to deal with. 
Um, but we do have uh, a, a good amount of odd chain fatty acids in our body. Okay. And so how that works in, in beta oxidation, beta oxidation would occur as it normally does and two carbons would be removed from the fatty acid chain each cycle until you reach um, the end set where you would have uh, five carbons left. Two of them would be re removed as acetyl-CoA, and then you'd be left with a three-carbon fatty acid, and that's called propanyl-CoA. Right, so you have, it's kind of like propane, where you have a, a, the three-carbon uh, in your chain um, but you have this, this fatty acid end to it. Okay. So that is going to be converted into something that's more usable and, and can be broken down. And the three steps to doing this, um, one propanyl CoA carboxylase, uh, you would actually add a carbon to it here and, and you're using ATP to do this. So it's, it requires energy. Okay. Uh, and specifically, the carbon you're adding is here, a CO2 group, right? Uh, the next one in this, this molecule, I should mention, is methyl melanyl coa okay? methyl melanyl coa epimerase uh, then converts this uh, structure into this structure. So what you're doing is you're moving where the CoA is. You're taking it uh, from this carbon and you're sticking it to that, that carbon that was then at, that just added, All right? And then the last enzyme is methyl melanyl CoA mutase, which uses uh, vitamin B12. Uh, and that, that um, mutates this uh, methyl melanyl CoA into succinyl CoA, okay? And succinyl CoA, if you remember, that's uh, an intermediate in the citric acid cycle. So then this can, can go directly into that citric acid cycle. The steps here, the exact steps, um, you don't need to know. But I, I would like you to know that e how this, how the end of oxidation, the beta oxidation, if you have an, an odd number of carbons, how each of those carbons would, would fare um, specifically meaning you'd have one acetyl CoA and then your propanyl CoA um, would be where you're, you deal with the odd number of carbons and then that gets converted into something that can go into the citric acid cycle. Right. If you have deficiencies in, in some of these enzymes, it's also pretty drastic, right? Um, we think of, you know, you know, the majority of your fatty acids are even chain. So maybe, you know, the minor number of odd chain fatty acids, if you can't break them down, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but it, it really is. Um, defici deficiencies in propanyl-CoA carboxylase, that first enzyme there, it, it occur in about one in every 100,000 babies. So it's a, a rare disorder, but it causes a very severe affliction. Um, where you have propanyl CoA accumulating and and um, blocking a lot of other metabolic processes. Uh, fatty acid oxidation, as we've mentioned before, is is regulated, and, and that's because you don't want a futile cycle going on where you're we're synthesizing fatty acids and breaking them down. So we've mentioned this earlier in the lecture. This is just where it comes in. Our melanyl CoA uh, is our first intermediate in the synthesis of fatty acids. So that uh, the synthesis of fatty acids is, is shown here, where you have um, glucose can ultimately be used to produce acetyl CoA. Acetyl CoA can then be used to produce melanyl CoA, which then can be used to build up to fatty acids. Well, this melanyl CoA. Uh, feeds back and it inhibits our carnitine acyl transferase 1, which, remember, uses uh, carnitine to attach to a fatty acyl CoA to, to shuttle it into the mitochondria, right? So that uh, melanyl CoA is our, our feedback inhibitor to this.
So that's the, the real regulation of fatty acids that you should know for this class is, is just this, this feedback inhibition by melanolyl-CoA. The book talks about other, um, some other ways fatty acid um, synthesis or, or oxidation is regulated, and that's through transcription factors. We haven't really talked about transcription yet, so um, I don't really think you should be learning about transcription factors, but I just wanted to throw this out here um, because when we talk about transcription, maybe you can you know, think back to this and be like, oh, oh yeah, that's a, a transcription factor used to, to turn on um, the expression of, of certain genes that are, are needed for um, fatty acid oxidation. So far, we've talked exclusively about this oxidation in, in mitochondria. It turns out that beta oxidation also occurs in um, peroxisomes and, and uh, glyoxisomes uh, in plants. Not going to need to know those specific organelles for this class, but just showing you how, how they're similar. Um, uh, they are similar in pretty much every fashion except for that third step where you generate NADH, right? And in the mitochondria, that NADH can be reoxidized to NAD directly in the respiratory chain. The other organelles don't have the respiratory chain, so that just has to be exported for reoxidation. Okay. The last section in the book talks about ketone bodies. It's a fairly short section. Um, what ketone bodies are, um, specifically, they're shown here, acetone, acetoacetate, and D-beta-hydroxybutyrate. Okay, so you have uh, your acetone, three carbons with a ketone. Um, acetoacetate, we have uh, an acetyl group and an acetate group, right? So it turns out it's four carbons. Uh, and then beta D hydroxybutyrate is four carbons, but our ketone group in our acetoacetate is now an alcohol. Right? Just need to know these these three key, they are ketone bodies. Okay. They're formed from acetyl CoA in the liver. Right? Um, how they get uh, dealt with a little bit different uh, acetone is is different that is it it's exhaled um, from our bodies so that's how it's eliminated the other two can be transported to non-liver tissues and converted back to acetyl coa to be used in the citric acid cycle so this is a way our liver can um, convert some of the um, acetyl CoA is generated from, from fatty acid breakdown into things that can be transported through our bodies to other cells that then can be used for energy. Okay. So, and specifically under um, starvation conditions uh, is typically when these become important. And, and a lot of people um, try to, to use this um, in the form of a ketogenic diet, right? By, by eating, um, you know, a very high fat diet uh, and trying to force your body to produce these ketone bodies, um, it, it's thought of a way that you can actually um, burn fat and, and lose weight. Uh, there are steps shown here. I, I don't expect you to know any of these steps specifically. Um, thiolase uh, is that that's an enzyme that we've talked about before in beta oxidation. Uh, it can be used to take two molecules of acetyl CoA, uh, sort of working it backwards here, right, um, from what we think of in beta oxidation. But it, you can take two molecules of acetyl CoA and and push that back, and what you form is this acetyl um, acetyl acetyl CoA, which is that four carbon um, molecule or ketone body, right? That then can be converted 
uh, this ketone group here can be converted into a, uh, an OH group um, by an enzyme known as HMG CoA synthetase, right? And that molecule again is beta hydroxy uh, methyl glutaryl CoA. Uh, and then another step here by that same enzyme will um, produce acetoacetate, which is our, our uh, second ketone body. So we have, um, or excuse me, is that is the ketone body. The acetoacyl CoA is not a ketone body, right? It has a CoA on it, um, but this step produces our acetoacetate, which is our ketone body. Acetoacetate then has ha, can have two different um, fates. Uh, you can either lose a, a CO2 group from it and, and form acetone, which is then exhaled, or it can be converted um, into our uh, beta hydroxy butyrate. And that's a process that either uses NADH or generates NADH, depending on which way you're going, right? So these two are, are our ketone bodies that are gonna be transported and, and used to produce acetyl-CoA and energy in other cell types. <clears throat> so a good overview of, of this process is in this figure from the book, right? What I think I would expect you to know for ketone bodies, right? The three of the three ketone bodies, um, their names basically, and maybe not their structures so much, um, but how fatty acids can be used to produce acetyl-CoA through beta oxidation, okay? Um, you know, if under starvation conditions, right, all you have left, you're not ingesting any sugars. So theoretically, your, your storage of sugars can be depleted um, fairly quickly compared to the fat storage. So if that happens, you're gonna be using primarily your fat storage and what you would use your fats to produce is acetyl-CoA, right? That can then, acetyl-CoA can then be used to produce uh, ketone bodies, okay? So you have this sort of cycle here of fatty acids to produce ketone bodies in the liver specifically. They can be then transported into um, tissues that, that need it, such as the heart, uh, muscle, kidney, and brain. And specifically, the heart um, uses uh, primarily fatty acids for its, um, for its energy production. There are other things uh, like the brain that uses uh, almost entirely sugars. So um, these, these ketone bodies are, are a way to um, help, you know, keep your keep your brain on in a sense when they're there you have uh, very limited sugar uh, sugars available to you uh, and that's another um, branch to this right if you're using acetyl coa to produce ketones you can also be using uh, intermediate in the citric acid cycle oxaloacetate to go back to glucose in the liver that glucose can be then uh, transported for brains and, and other tissues that use um, primarily glucose. Well, as I mentioned, there, there are people that are trying ketogenic diets for weight loss. Um, there's also other um, usages of ketones in, in performance sports for uh, sort of a, a way to to recover better and, and have better energy usage. And the one I know of is professional cycling. There are certain teams that use a, a ketone drink during, during and, and after races to sort of exploit this, this pathway for energy production. Um, so I think the theory there is to to use these ketone bodies uh, instead of maybe your glycogen reserves, so then you can recover better and and have more energy during during the event. Right. One, um, the results seem to, to seem to show that that works. Um, there is some downsides and some dangers to this. 
uh, trying to do a ketogenic diet, if you're if you are truly in what's called ketosis, it's a very serious metabolic condition, and it it stems from the fact that uh, you get lowered blood pH due to increased levels of some of these ketone bodies. And that's referred to as, as acidosis, a lowered blood pH. Right? And ketosis is high levels of ketone bodies. So you get a combination of that uh, ketoacidosis. And that's a very serious condition um, <coughs> that requires, uh, excuse me, requires, um, you know, immediate medical attention. So trying to do some of these uh, diets is, is really, can be, can be a little bit dangerous. Um, you just need to make sure you're, that you're in, ingesting enough uh, calories um, and enough um, sugars as well. You, you do, need, do you do need some sugars and, and of course, drinking enough water.